everybody. Welcome to Crime Geek. I'm Mikey and this is our very first video. So thank you for coming and hanging out. Uh, we got a real bad banner for you. This was our Vegas' uh, crime of the century. This was our OJ and this is a pretty crazy love triangle. I mean, it's Vegas. We got everything, right? We got sex and drugs and money and it's pretty crazy. And the main character is Ted Binion. This is the murder or suicide or accidental overdose or we're not sure. We're going to try and figure this out. But uh, I'm going to give you a little history of why maybe Ted Binion had some bad habits and it might be from his poppy. Daddy was a bit of a gangster himself. So let's check it out. Hey, Paul, how you doing? Good. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So the, before we talk about the Vegas portion of Benny Binion's life, we have to tell a little bit about the Texas portion of his life, where I think the word gangster would have to apply, right? Oh, I think so, or racketeer, whatever uh, nomenclature you wish to use. But yeah, he had, a, he had a group of criminals who did his bidding, and he ultimately controlled... Um, almost all the gambling in, in Dallas and the Dallas area, and he, he had a, a good organization working. Not only did he have an organization, he also had some connections with the law, but that couldn't keep him from being charged with murder. Was it three times? Twice, Twice. but he walked away from them both. Uh, yeah, he, he owned the courts. He owned the judges. He owned the sheriff's department. He owned the Dallas police. He, he paid handsomely for this ownership, but he owned them. So why did he have to leave Dallas? Well, he backed the wrong candidates in the 1946 elections, so he lost his uh, his man in the sheriff's department, he lost the sheriff, and he lost the DA. So they told him, uh, either leave town or you'll be killed or arrested. So he loaded up his Cadillac with uh, allegedly a million dollars in cash. He got two of his henchmen with Tommy guns, and he drove from Dallas to Las Vegas and started a new life in Las Vegas. So Benny moved here in 1951 and bought the Eldorado Club. He was so successful with that, he bought the property right next door, Hotel Apache, and he combined those two to make Binion's Horseshoe. 77,000 square feet of gaming floor. That was a big deal back then. And it ended up being a Las Vegas landmark. It was a place to be high rollers and celebrities, and it was just amazing. Benny is also the creator of World Series of Poker, and we all know how massive that is. My father started this over 30 years ago, and it started out just a gathering of friends and turned into this huge affair that is worldwide and nationally known. This took it out of the back room and it took away the, the seedy element of poker and it gave it legitimacy. It was an absolute adrenaline rush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was something I'll never forget. It was great. It was great. I knew I was going to lose. The question was how. And so to lose to Doyle, I, I had uh, pocket kings. Right. He had pocket aces. So I, I, I went after him with my final 6,200 bucks, and, and, and he took it from me. So it was a good. I'm going home with a story. When you're playing with these guys, there, there may be luck on any given hand, but over over time, the, the really terrific players will crush you. It's like it's like. And when you're playing with people at that level, it's like hitting with a Von Lendl or something. You you are just totally outmatched, and you can feel it. So in 1953, Benny Binion went to prison for tax evasion. He lost his gaming license and had to turn over control of the casino to his two sons, Jack and Ted. And they were actually quite successful. Binion's horseshoe became even bigger. They had a million dollars in cash and $10,000 bills in the lobby. It was, it was a cool sight. But this is when Teddy started to go downhill. Too much wine women and song and hookers and blow, it was a bad deal. So in 1995, things are really going downhill for Teddy. He's had a couple of arrests for drugs. He's going through a divorce and he's hanging out at the strip club. And this is where he meets our second angle of our triangle, Sandy Murphy. She was there for, I think for two weekends where she sold costumes. And I think on the first weekend, uh, some patron started to bother her. And management immediately came over and suggested that she go to a different area and uh, assuring her that she would be protected and no one would bother her. This area was the table where Mr. Binion was sitting at. And that's how they met. 7 a.m. on 
April 17th of 1995, he showed up on my doorstep. Um, he knocked on the door and I answered it and he threw his arms around me and he said, I don't ever want to not know where you are again. And um, proceeded to go into the house and load up my things in the car and, and move me in and that was that. Um, it, was, uh, it was pretty exciting and, you know, a little overwhelming, but um, we were in love. And uh, I think that any normal woman would have admired that in her man. Now, Teddy's even in more trouble. He's hanging around local gangsters like fat Herbie Blitzstein, wherever you are. I think he's dead. I think he's dead. He's dead. And the gaming board's not having it, so they finally completely revoke his gaming license. He's not even allowed on the property. So he goes back to the hotel and he grabs somewhere between seven and $12 million worth of silver. No one is sure, but there's 100,000 silver coins, silver bars, it's outrageous. And now comes in our third triangle of our love triangle, third angle of our triangle is Rick Tavish. This is a friend of Teddy's who he hires to go dig a hole out in Pahrump and put a vault in it. Pahrump is a small town about 60 miles outside of Vegas pretty far outside of town and he thinks his money's going to be safe there. But he and Rick are the only ones that have the combination. Uh, so in 1998, Ted's problems are still continuing and more so at home. They're saying that because of his drugs and alcohol, he can no longer perform in the bedroom. And that's his, this is when he's figured out that Sandy and Rick are having an affair behind his back. Now, the day before his death, he goes to his lawyer and says, take Sandy out of my will. We're done. And if anything happens to me, she's the cause of it. Now, supposedly that same day, he went out and bought 13 bags of top, black tar heroin. That's a lot. Even for me. I mean, I, 10 is my limit, but, you know. Anyway. So September 17, 1998, Ted Benny was found dead in his living room by Sandy Murphy. That's when she called 911 and she was hysterical, so hysterical that they had to take her away in an ambulance. But the odd thing is that they ruled it, originally ruled it a suicide, but all that heroin was in his stomach. And he was a smoker. He smoked the heroin. This is what he told his family and friends because he did not want to accidentally overdose. He always told them, I take it a little bit and I'm fine. So later on, the Binion family would put their own investigation team on. And they are the ones that put enough evidence together to get the murder charges against Sandy Murphy and Rick Tavish. I became involved in this case in uh, late September of 1998 when uh, the special administrator for the estate of uh, Ted Binion came to see me at my office uh, and requested uh, that uh, my office conduct an investigation into the facts and circumstances surrounding Mr. Binion's death. Uh, he said the family members uh, uh, and particularly Jack Binion, uh, the, the executor of his estate, were not comfortable with uh, an accidental overdose or, or a suicide, and they felt that there was uh, more evidence to be gleaned from an investigation. It didn't take Detective Dillard long to figure out that Rick Tavish was more than just a friend of Teddy. He and... Uh, Sandra had something going on behind the scenes. He, he, he was just obvious. I just got here. I just drove up just a minute ago. Okay. What were so, your first thoughts? Uh, what a tragedy. What were so, your first thoughts? What a tragedy. It's one of those situations where you've been to many crime scenes, as I have. I was, I'm a former homicide detective, and it just didn't pass the smell test. There's such a contrast between the Sandy Murphy and the interview tapes, how sweet and innocent she is. And then you see her in this video where she's doing inventory in the house and cursing the Binion family and she's just not the same sweet little girl. And you'll see her in the kitchen pick up a wine glass and walk backwards and do a misdirection for the camera who's behind her. And you could see her put that in her purse. This is when, this is when I was convinced that 
her and Rick had something to do with it, especially since Rick showed up two days after chasing that silver. You just got to keep in mind that this is the day after, I mean the morning after his death. It's She just seems so cold. Make sure you get a pile of this. All this stuff, when I left my house, was in the garage and it's all been taken out. The shelves were full and they've all been moved. Okay. So doing a complete inventory of the house and trying to find things that are missing so she could point the finger at his family. She's even talking horrible things about his family and how stupid they are and all the things that they had missed when they went in. My piano, open my piano drawer, I got music in there, I got another pistol in there, I bet they forgot about that one because they weren't smart enough to f***ing look. Here you go. This is the part of the tape that really convinced me that they were guilty. You can see her pick up the wine glass right here, switches it to her right hand, and starts to feed it into her bag while she misdirects with her left hand. So crazy. This uh, segment uh, shows a lady in, in a kitchen, is that right? Yes. Uh, did you see her pick up something with her left hand? Yes, I did. Were you able to freeze frame uh, the uh, object which was picked up in the left hand? Where the tape comes to a stop and holds for like 10 seconds, that is the object that's in her left hand. You can see the glare, glitter from it. What is your opinion, sir? My opinion is it looks similar to the wine glasses that are on the previous tape about 10 seconds past that point. And did you see what she did uh, with uh, the wine glass in her left hand? It disappeared. It's really amazing that this video was shot a day after his death. And a day before his death, he warned everybody that this might happen, and sure enough. And then two days later, here's Rick Tabish digging up all of his silver. I have a hard time believing that these two were not in cahoots. And you got to see all the pictures and video of these two. Even in the courtroom, they're on, on fighting for their lives. And they're giggling and flirting and having a great time. Yeah, in this clip you can see Rick Tabish mouth the word hi, and she bats her eyelashes, and then they both realize that it's probably super inappropriate. Yeah, head down. We're supposed to be in trouble. It wasn't long after this that all the reporters figured out that Rick Tabish wasn't just a concerned friend. He was like main player, you know, number two. And the day after this, he went and dug up all of that silver. He's just, uh, yeah, there's, there's something there. You can't tell me there's not. Rick had talked about that he was going to gonna get the silver from, uh, from Binion. He said that Binion had a lot of rare coins and that uh, he, you know, was going to get his hands on it. Uh, did he tell you what type of relationship he had with Sandra Murphy? Oh yes, he, he said that uh, uh, Binion was, you know, drunk and knocked out with drugs most of the time and uh, he couldn't really perform so I, his direct words were excuse me your honor he was f sandra murphy all the time and she was re really loving and ted had told sergeant huggins that if anything should ever happen to him he should get out there to that location and make sure that uh, that silver was uh, protected because uh, if he was dead then somebody was coming after the silver so when sergeant huggins who was off duty on that particular day uh, heard that Ted Benning had died, he called a, a sergeant, uh, another sergeant uh, uh, who was on duty and asked him to drive by and take a look and see what was going on. Well, the, uh, the duty sergeant went over to the location and uh, they were just loading up and getting ready to leave when uh, he encountered uh, Rick Tabish, Michael Milo, and uh, David Matson. They concluded that these individuals were committing a grand larceny and they were, they were ultimately arrested. 
His girlfriend, Sandra Murphy, and her other boyfriend, Rick Tabish, were tried for the murder of Ted Binion and burglary of the silver. They were convicted on the murder charges, but later acquitted. The burglary and larceny convictions stuck. Police also found a treasure map in Tabish's apartment, though there was just an empty hole where the X marked the spot. Uh, that someone sat on his chest, thereby, thereby not allowing the lungs to expand, and perhaps because of this pressure on the chest and the buttons on Ted Binion's shirt, it caused these marks to add around the time of death. And he said that the hand or pillow over the mouth would have caused this redness around his mouth. Well, in, in hindsight, I guess that's not necessarily the way I would have envisioned him dying. I would envision him dying, you know, in a hail of gunfire and a shootout, protecting his, uh, you know, riding gunshot on a, while, you know, protecting his silver or something or other possessions that um, it really is not a, a, a colorful way to die. She said that he was, he had a drug problem and he was going to OD on heroin and after that she was going to be with her boyfriend. It was a pretty exciting trial. They even bring in world famous Michael Bodden to look over all the medical examiner's paperwork. In my experience, um, the amount of drug that, uh, that Mr. Binion had in his system could cause death, but the great majority of people who had that amount would not die. Biden described bruises at the side of Ted Binion's mouth and on his chest. Now the DA had a new theory on how Binion died. It was murder by suffocation. The marks around the mouth would uh, indicate some kind of pressure in the mouth-nose area, um, which would lead to my opinion that uh, suffocation was the cause of death. It was a uh, easy assumption to make. Uh, that a, a, a person who used heroin as extensively as Ted Binion was known to do uh, could have overdosed uh, on drugs. It's a logical thing that, a logical conclusion that someone could make, but you had to look a little deeper, and when you looked a little deeper, you saw that that was not the case. So eventually they were both convicted of murder, grand larceny, robbery, so many counts, and then they were granted a retrial later and both acquitted of the murder, but they were both still had to do time for the grand larceny. And Sandy Murphy had already been in prison for four years during the trial, and then she was released for time served. Rick Tabish ended up being released in 2010. They were granted a new trial based upon the technicality, the Nevada Supreme Court uh, granted her a new trial and Rick Tabish. They got that trial and in 2005 they were found not guilty of, of murder and there was another case having to do with burglary. Sandy was still found guilty on that that charge as was Rick Tabish. Her sentence was time served on that so she was released from prison. Um, so she, she was in prison for four years. So here's a lesson for you kids. Karma doesn't exist because both Sandy Murphy and Rick Tavish are both very wealthy and successful after the fact. I think Sandy stopped being a silver digger and became a gold digger. She married a wealthy art gallery owner in Southern California. She's doing all right. You should see the pictures of her before and after. Yeah, had some surgery, spent some dough. She might have had some dough tucked away. I don't know. I'm convinced that these two are, are guilty. You guys tell me what you think. And Rick Tavish became very successful, I, I believe, in Montana. Anyway, he started his own company and does well. All right, everybody. We're going to wrap that story up, but thanks for coming by. This was quite a learning experience for me with all this new software, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you did, please give me a thumbs up. And if you want to hang out again next week, Hit the subscribe button and I'll try and get a video out every week. You want to say I love you? Say bye bye, I love you. Um. Yeah, that's a good one.